kind of kick it off uh, with a, to, to put this conversation in context. Um, you know, I think everybody here knows that uh, it, the, the craft beer segment is super, super crowded these days. Um, I'm sure there was some discussion of that uh, at the Next Gen event this week. Um, and I think some people would argue that it's perhaps overcrowded. Uh, you know, that's not really for me to decide, but we do know that there are about 6,700 breweries currently in operation. That was through June 30th, so uh, opening at a rate of like two to two and a half per day. Um, and uh, I'd say 10 years ago, there were about 1,500 breweries. Uh, we actually came to Austin in 2014 for a Brew Talks event. We were over at uh, the Chive offices. Um, and at that time, uh, there were 3,000 breweries. So, I mean, more than double in the last time that we've been to, since the last time we've been to Austin. It's just crazy to see the amount of growth. Um, and uh, that's put kind of a strain on the business in general. Uh, it's put a strain on wholesalers and on retailers. And it's also put a strain on brewers trying to figure out how to navigate the marketplace now, trying to you know, decide which strategies are best selling you know, core flagships versus one-off small batches that all the on-premise operators want. Um, it's tricky, and uh, you know, I don't know that anybody has uh, the, the right answer. I don't know if there is a right answer, um, but there are some different unique ways that people are approaching the marketplace now, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but to kind of set the scene, I want to first uh, lean on Bob here and, and just get perspective, having been in the business for so long. Uh, you were one of the early craft uh, and specialty beer pioneers. You distributed Sierra Nevada in the mid-1980s. You imported some pretty iconic Belgian brands, Duval and Chimay, uh, into the U.S. for the first time. And uh, you actually helped develop the packaging strategy for Corona. Um, so you've kind of had a, a front row seat for all this evolution. Can you give us just a little bit of perspective on how much the beer space has changed over the last 30, 40 years and how competitive it is for you now that you're uh, in, in charge of overseeing a, a small craft beer operation here in Austin in Uncle Billy's? Well, uh, you're ready to hear me. I would say that um, it would be an understatement to say that there's no comparison between 1977 when I got into the beer business here in Austin and today's market, whether it's Austin or anywhere else. Um, I, I started out right out of college just kind of falling into the beer business with an opportunity to get into a distributorship, um, a little three-person company called Shiner of Austin. And our lead brand was Shiner and a couple of Mexican beers. And at that time, the variety in the marketplace were um, a few brands like Ballantine Ale and uh, Cold Springs Lager and a few things like that. They were considered different, if not specially, they were considered different. And, um, and kind of a four-tier system in the domestic scene, which was super premium, something like Michelob. And then the national brands like Bud and Miller and Schlitz and, and uh, Coors in a few markets. Um, and then the Texas brands, uh, the, the statewide Texas brands like Pearl and Lone Star, and then Shiner. Uh, and they were pretty much looked at in the marketplace in that category too. Shiner was the cheapest thing on the market and, and considered the the local brand and back then local wasn't uh, wasn't an asset. It was considered um, uh, low quality, low uh, esteem. Um, you know, you had to find a unique market to sell something like Shiner, um, and the Mexican brands fit in towards the top of that. And and that was pretty much the variety. Um, Anchor Steam wasn't available yet in, in Austin at that time. Um, we brought it in later uh, in the early 80s. Um, but um, So there wasn't a lot of variety, honestly. I mean, if you looked at the marketplace, there really wasn't that much diversity. And as a small distributor, um, our only asset was looking for diversity, looking for something that would set things apart uh, from everything else on the market. And um, that was our marketing strategy, really, was to try to create points of difference that we could talk about um, in our portfolio. 
dark Mexican beers were, like Dos Equis, because Dos Equis at that time was only a dark beer, uh, that, was, that was an extreme situation. <laughs> and Schneiderbach was Equis. an extreme situation because it was dark. Uh, and that literally was points of, of difference that yeah. made a difference. Yeah, uh, obviously much more difficult nowadays to have a point of difference now that, you know, everything has gotten kind of out of control in terms of uh, how many brands there are and, and just how many SKUs there are. It's, it's really tough to be different today. Uh, Todd, how's Dogfish doing it? And um, how are you guys as a kind of heritage brand now in the, in the craft space staying relevant and staying different? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're lucky to have is a founder in Sam Caligioni who's always pushing the boundaries. Some days his ideas are, you, you can't wrap your head around them. And I know the first time he came into our uh, room and started talking to us about Sequench Ale, he started going through this idea about this beer that was going to brew in Sequence, and it was a Kolsch, a Gosa, and a Berliner Weiss. Then all that would be blended together, and it would also have sea salt, lime, everything. We're like, what are you talking about? And then two years later, that grew rapidly out there, and uh, now it is our really our number two beer in our portfolio. It's grown at 100%. And so sometimes you have to trust your gut, and Sam's got a great gut. So when he brought that to the room, I'm wrapping my head around it going, how are we going to sell this? How are we going to explain this? What, you know, we, then we had to go in that way. Uh, you have to continually, I think as a brewery, know who you are, and then where are you comfortable stretching out to from there? And uh, then you have to figure out, you know, who's the right consumer for this and where are the right accounts that we go for with the brand. Yeah. Now, in, in Texas specifically, Amy, uh, you guys have been around for a while now, too. And uh, I was over at the brewery the other day, and um, I think I told you when, when we sat down that, you know, it, it reminded me of kind of walking into the first brewery that I walked into for the first time. It's in the back of, you know, an industrial park, and you're kind of walking up a loading ramp, and um, you don't see too many breweries like that anymore. Uh, but you've, you know, kind of had a front row seat as well to a lot of change just here locally in Austin. So how does independence stay different? And, um, you know, just kind of how difficult has it become to, to even pitch the local angle for, for something like independence? I think we fall um, in a situation where, you know, when we first started, we did try to find um, our differences in a way, like Bob was explaining, but the landscape was much different. So um, when you were, in, in some regards, facing a little bit less competition in terms of variety, um, it felt uh, to me now, looking back, a little bit easier um, because there were, you know, just some, there were imports on the market. There was a little bit of interest. Um, there definitely was a developing scene, and, and we were able to you know, get involved in that fairly early. Um, I think our lessons learned are a little bit of trying to continue to push ourselves to try new styles, keep brewing, keep our finger on the pulse of what uh, we want to be taking. First of all, what do we want to drink? <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> what do people around us want to drink? What do we see happening in the world around us? And most importantly for us, I think, is just also kind of building on things that are story and, and meaningful to us. I think one of the points of distribution can also be in terms of building your brand, of you know, tying into things that have resonance for people and have meaning for people. And you know, in some regards, when everybody is brewing a beer that's very similar to yours, you know, some attachment or some meaning to that is also very important. And so, you know. We've had to, you know, over the years in a beer like Stash IPA, which we're really well known for, you know, due to hop contracts or whatnot, you have to tweak it here and there. And it's it's more it's most important to us to to keep it fresh, keep it alive, keep it meaning what it meant to us when we first started brewing it. And it doesn't mean radical changes in it, but you've got to kind of keep building the things that made you strong and embrace the things that what people like about you while also trying out new things. And um, you know, for us, in a lot of ways, being able to have a small tap room at the brewery now um, has allowed us to have an audience to taste these beers that we're playing around with. So um, actually, when I first met, one of the first times I heard Sam Calgione talk, he was you know, obviously very expressive of how having a small tap room was instrumental into being able to try new beers and try recipes out. So it's very difficult to have an audience out and about in a bar with an unproven concept. So being able to 
experiment at your own facility, get people in trying the beers. I think that's fundamental now more than ever of getting feedback on what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, building that c uh, consumer loyalty in-house and then expanding from there. Um, you told a great <coughs> story the other day when we were hanging out about kind of zigging when everybody else zags or vice versa. And um, there was a, a particular, st I'll let you tell the story that you do it best. <laughs> there was a particular style of beer that everybody was kind of chasing after. And you guys kind of had a Berliner Weiss style in your, in your back pocket that you had been messing around with and, um, you know, ended up kind of going after that instead. And, and that's become one of your more popular brands. So you guys took a style approach at least uh, that time and, and it worked out. Yeah, so our head brewer, Brandon Radicke, um, he had, when he first joined our team, um, brought some of his beers from home. Uh, he's one of the only few guys I know that had one of the most amazing Berliner Weisses I ever had brewed in a garage. Um, and so <laughs> we were a couple years in working together and we launched our seasonal program. And, uh, you know, he really wanted to do a session IPA. He was like, everybody's going to be doing a session IPA. We need to do a session IPA. And I was like, yeah, everyone's doing a session IPA. Uh, maybe we should try something else. And, and they're like, well, what? And I was like, how about that Berliner, man? That was awesome. You should do that. And uh, it kind of was an alignment of, you know, <laughs> our head of QA and new equipment coming online and us having the capacity to do it. I said, we should go for it. You know, if you guys can know that you can do it, uh, then we should do it. You know, and it was great for us just because it kind of freed us up from a direction where everybody was pursuing one thing at that particular time in the market. And I think that happens a lot in beer, uh, especially lately, where it's really hard to stand out in that regard if everybody's doing a certain style. Um, and some people are just going to get ahead of it first, and some people will do it extremely well. And I think I drank way more Session IPAs that one year than I ever have since. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, I was really happy with how it turned out, and uh, I mean, we're certainly not the very first brewer to ever do a Berliner Weiss, but the timing was right for us, and I was really proud of uh, our head brewer's work, and it turned out great for us. Yeah. We talked a little bit about kind of trend spotting and um, trusting your gut. How do you guys know, and this is sort of a question for everyone, how do you guys know which trends to follow and which to, you know, kind of take uh, a wait-and-see approach on? Um, and, and, I mean, you were talking about, you know, it, investing a lot of uh, dollars into sales and marketing and building programs out in some cases for uh, a really unproven concept or a really unproven brand. So walk me through maybe the decision-making process of developing a new brand and, you know, trying to capitalize on an emerging trend at the right time. You know, you don't want to be too early and you don't want to be too late. So. How do you figure that out? Um, and we'll just kind of go down the line. I'll, I'll start with Bob. Well, I'd say that's, that's a very difficult question to answer, and, and it's kind of an individual question. Um, as Amy said, I think you kind of have to trust your gut. You have to assess who you are as a brewery, what your image is, what your market is, you know, who you're targeting, and, and blend that into the decision. Um, you can't go too far from your from your your path, I would say, but um, but you need to um, take advantage of what you see in the market if it fits you. And if it doesn't, maybe it's not right for you. Um, I don't know. I think it's it's just trusting your knowledge of the market and your feel for what's going to work and what's not going to work. I'm not sure I, I have any analyticals to define that. Yeah, and I this may not be politically correct, so it's just my opinion. Is this is not sponsored by Dogfish's opinion? <laughs> uh, you got to get the MBA and analytics out of the room. Uh, they, well, they can provide great insight into trends, what's occurring. A lot of that is what's occurred. And if all of us as brewers or we all are jumping on top of each other going, okay, we saw rosés are doing well, or we saw ciders, and, and you're jumping on the trend, you're probably jumping on it after it occurred. So a lot of it, you've got to go with your gut, but you also have to go with insight. And I mean, some of the insight can be basic is we, we argued for months over years for whether to do a can line. At one point, I'm walking into an account, um, um, I 
forgot the retailer in New York. I apologize to that retailer. You gave great advice. He goes, 40% of my craft beer business in the summer is cans. Well, that was a 40% we weren't playing in. At that point, it's like we need to get in the can business. Then we had to figure out what are the right brands for the cans. Research isn't going to tell that, us that. We've got to go, okay, this brand is probably worth this much. It's at this price point. The consumer is going to be drinking it. Our friends are going to be drinking it outside. So, the, yeah, that should be a can beer. That's got to be something a portable for occasion. So it's blending your gut with some data and some information, but there's a lot of big breweries out there that are getting into this game and they're re relying on their MBA analytics and you can look at the brands they've kicked out and they're missing yeah. because they're so locked on the data. Any, any Miller Coors folks in here? Uh, I apologize. Where's, where's the, where's the, who's drinking two hats right now? Um, <laughs> miss. Um, okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah? It, it, it's not going to sit around on the retail shelves until early 2019, like they said? Or are you going to dump all that or what? Um. <laughs> I would just add, I think there's a certain confidence building. It, when you've worked on a recipe for a long time, there's just times where you know the timing is right. And, um, and if it's not there and you still need to work on it, don't force it. Yeah. Right? There's times where you really want to release something, and it may not just be right yet. And yeah. so the half the battle is also waiting. And there's times we've made something and we've just waited, <laughs> you know, and that's actually harder, I think, than uh, yeah, you launching. Wanna, you want to step really on the gas pedal and you, know, you want to push it. Um, but I think that inherently you have to know that it's really good, especially now if you're going to invest money in launching something big, you've got to know that it's the best that you can come up with. It's your best version. You know, you've taken the time to, to make what you want to make. Yeah. Um, a lot of wholesalers in the room, obviously. How much do you guys rely on their feedback for new product development and uh, just some of the thinking around the way that you guys strategize, you know, in terms of portfolio construction, um, innovation, things like that? And I'll start with Amy. Our distributors have been very helpful, especially our home distributor here, Brown Distributing. Um, they have been someone that I do have been able to approach um, just to make sure that uh, some of our ideas are gonna work and uh, gather their feedback and what they think is um, you know, gonna be viable. Um, I, I also know that if they're really excited about it, then, then that's good for us. <laughs> um, I would say that there's also been the counterpoint where a couple years back uh, I was like, hey, I'm not gonna make a hard root beer, so you know, there's things that come and go. So, I mean, I think that your distributor has a lot of insight into uh, what's happening in, in especially at certain chain retail um, trends that they see, um, opportunities that you may be missing. And so you definitely need to listen and see if, if some of the suggestions are things that can work for you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that. <laughs> Todd, you got hundreds of distributors to listen to. Yeah. Yeah, 100, and I spent my first 11 years in the business on the distributor side, so I gave my advice to a lot of suppliers. Um, none of them listened to me, but uh, <laughs> so uh, as I went out now, I mean, one of the things we do, and you have to be careful in this area because if you're just following on the trends and distributors reporting back to you just what the trends are occurring, it may lead you down the wrong path. But spending a lot of time with the people on the streets, they can walk through what's happening, and... So if I'm in a market, I'm in Pittsburgh, New York, Chicago, and I'm in Austin, I'm beginning to see the same thing that's occurring. I go, okay, that's more than just in this market. That's right. in that. Uh, one of the things we do at Dogfish, and it's really helped us through the years, uh, we have distributors come to the brewery, and Sam does a fireside chat with them. And you give them a little bit of liquid truth serum and feed it into them, and they'll start talking about what's going on in the market. And you start hearing consistent themes. You start hearing what's working. You start hearing about things that are dying before it hits the press and before it shows up in the data. So you, you can begin to really develop an intuitive gut that way of what's going on out there. Yeah. Bob, you've got perhaps a unique perspective, uh, kind of having the uh, artisanal imports uh, experience and working with you know, a bunch of different brands from all different uh, backgrounds, and then you know now being on the craft side, you've been on the wholesale side. Um, how much would you trust the the wholesaler opinion as it uh, as it relates to just overall portfolio construction and 
um, you know, continued evolution of a, of a portfolio for a brewery? Well, I think uh, uh, Todd and Amy are both right in, in what they said. I think the wholesaler is critical because the wholesaler is going to be your, they're your partner in this, and if they're not convinced right off the bat, you better be convinced enough in yourself and in the product to convince them because at the end of the day, they have to make it happen. Uh, and, it, and from what Todd said, I would also agree that um, I still do a fair amount of traveling with artisanal or, and visit different distributors around the country. And, and you get a pretty good feel for trends, uh, not only in your local market, but in other markets when you start seeing the same thing and over and over and hearing the same thing over and over. And really, I think on the street is where um, you get the best information. It's with uh, the distributors, salespeople in the bars and restaurants and retail trade. And, and you see what they're seeing and you hear what they have to say. And, and that's really kind of the grassroots of the, of the business. And that will probably give you the best feel for the, the slight tweaks in the trend. Everybody says, oh, this is selling well, and then you go in and you start talking to people, and maybe that's not, that was true a month ago, but it's not really true now. It's already on the, slipped over the hill, and, and you, you learn that out on the street. Yeah. Uh, speaking of getting out on the streets, Todd, you, you obviously visit a lot of uh, markets around the country. You've got a pretty diverse portfolio, um, both in terms of sort of style and package type. As you start to think about those individual markets and the different classes of trade in those markets, how do you determine which products make the most sense uh, by account type, be it you know a C store or a grocery store or an independent bottle shop or an on-premise account? How do you start to think about the way that you kind of slice up your portfolio and deliver certain products to certain accounts? Yeah, one of the things we did a couple years ago, we began to look at, you see a blending of channels out there. C stores, they're behaving like grocery stores. Grocery stores behaving like liquor stores. You have bars all behaving differently. So we stopped looking at like, okay, here's our C store plan, here's our grocery plan, here's our liquor plan, and started looking at it. Where are they in their craft development? And so we begin to classify accounts as either emerging craft, craft, or craft centric. Well, a emerging craft account, we aren't going to take our esoteric brands. We aren't going to take Mort L into an emerging craft account. The people who are in that account aren't ready for that. So we have a smaller set of our portfolio that we really work with in there. And then when we get into the craft centric accounts, that's when we bring everything we have and really begin to work a little bit more with those retailers and a lot from the craft centric, from the on-premise, or a lot more in the rotation nation type. So what can we offer them during the year that works for their portfolio and working in that way. So that's the way we look at it. And also now pack size is just changing dramatically out there where you have different consumers looking for different pack size type. Yeah, and, and do you, kind of look at where the packages fit best? Like, would you take a 16-ounce liquid truth serum and, and stick, it, stick it in a convenience store? Or, you know, how do you start to think around yeah. packages? A lot of that. And also, you're working with your local wholesaler in that market. Because every market, I'll use 16-ounce cans as an example. You can be one city, and 16-ounce cans, four packs, are the hottest thing. And you could go to another market, and I'll use California as an example. They really don't care about the four-pack, 60-ounce cans. That just does not make sense in their market. So you've got to figure out what's right for that market and then what's right for that shopping occasion. So if someone's coming in there and they, need, they want to get a quick beer to go uh, have at dinner on their way home, you've got to have a couple single serve available. If they're more looking for a 12-pack and they're going to the beach, you've got to have 12-packs available for those accounts. Yeah. Amy, for independence, I mean, m maybe you... You can't offer quite as many uh, pack sizes as some of your competitors, some of your larger competitors. You really got to get specific on um, what opportunities you're going to go after, and especially being, you know, almost 100% uh, exclusively sold in Texas in a market like Texas that is, you know, chain driven with uh, HEB and, and Specs and some of the other chains here. Um, how does independence start to approach your portfolio strategy 
um, since it is, you know, almost like I said, almost 100% local and pretty limited in, in what you can offer. So before I answer the chain question, I would just say that um, when we were approaching different stores, a uh, situation almost like uh, we were just talking about, um, we tended to find that a good opportunity for testing out brands was also uh, occasionally at stores that were in these like little food deserts, or grocery store deserts, and you tend to have really great independent stores in those areas. And so before we go straight to you know the chain offering, it's important to have some outlets available for you to test out um, your offerings. And that is tricky to do, especially um, nowadays with cans and you know the commitment to a certain product format. But I still think that it's important um, to know uh, what's working in different neighborhoods and what's going to work for your various customer bases. So kind of the occasion somebody's chopping for is very important, but knowing what style is going to work in a particular setting is, is equally important. And so for us, um, you know, we were pretty fortunate, I think, in the sense that Whole Foods headquarters being in Austin and some really great chain retailers starting locally in Texas afforded us an opportunity to, you know, have some opportunity to test out um, beers in a grocery environment that maybe wouldn't necessarily happen all the time or happen in other parts of the country. So we were able to put our flagships out there um, in, in a grocery environment, but also work in a seasonal program and be able to to see what works. Um, I think that <clears throat> Having no, even in an environment where you don't have a lot of independently owned C stores, you're going to find some, right? And knowing that it works in a in a uh, convenience store environment, it's really important to be able then to approach uh, chain C stores. You got to know it works and why it works. Uh, what's the neighborhood demographic that's driving that? What's which? Why are people buying that? What's the rate of sale at those kind of stores? Just to be able to know what's working in in different neighborhoods for yourself and being able to then take that to a different city and see if you can find those neighborhoods and, and target those stores to begin with. So um, like I said, when we first moved from you know our Austin kind of San Antonio environment um, to try and start selling into Dallas or Houston, you know we were dealing, especially up in Dallas, with retailers that really we hadn't worked with very much before. Um, so we went back to the retailers we had worked with, and you know that one of them being Whole Foods, Central Market, um, and you know, started from there. What were what worked for us in those environments? Let's make sure that the neighborhoods are similar, or are the brands we're starting with in those stores making sense? Um, you know, the second part of your question, or talking on package size, you know, I think you have to find the right opportunities and be very secure in in, in knowing how you're going to approach a test because you've already made the commitment. Right. You know, you've got to know that your beer solid, that the concept's solid and that you're gonna make the effort. You know, you're gonna have a combination of your wholesaler selling it and yourselves out there selling it way in advance. Right. I think nowadays, um, especially just to make a good run of it and, and you've gotta be confident in that it's worth investing in and that uh, you have the right stores that you're trying to put that in. Yeah, I mean, it's especially considering when you've, you know, pre-purchased 100,000 printed cans or something yeah. like that, right? Um, and, and there is a cost element to all this, and there is, uh, you know, the, the investment consideration that needs to be made. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. How do you guys start to think about how you want to spend your money, where you want to spend your money, um, how you hire people uh, to work the streets and where you put them? Um, walk me through just kind of the the approach to spending money in the marketplace to support the brands that you guys are you know bringing to market. And I'll I'll start with Todd. Yeah, I think I'll take it a little bit back into part of the area where we really spend money as a brewery is in our ingredients, and it's a route we've chosen of okay to bring all real ingredients into our brewing process. That's expensive. That costs a lot. There are things we could do to really cut costs. And we haven't done that, but we want to really drive. We want to play on the high end of the high end. That's our role as a brewery, is to continue to help trade the consumer up within the craft category, within the beer category. So within that, we begin to look in the market of when we're, when we're hiring our team or finding people out there, people who can really un understand and explain to the retailer the pricing, the profitability, explain that to the distributor and work on that angle from it. 
Uh, so that's one of the areas we do. The other thing is, I mean, it is getting very competitive out there, so you can begin chasing every event out there, every bar promo, and really, really blow your budget. And so you have to be, and we, I mean, sometimes you you, you acted like we were really big, and to me, I feel really small because we've got the big guys trying to squash <laughs> us every day. So you've got to pick your battles, where to invest in, what packages in that market, what are the right uh, avenues to promote your brands in that market? And that still comes back to working with your local team, your local wholesaler. They know how best to get that message across. We've worked a lot on the digital angle to be able to really get our message across across the country to a lot of people. I've uh, been blessed with Mariah Caligioni really working on that through the years. So we've got on the for forefront of that. Yeah. But that business is not coming free anymore because whether it's Facebook, Twitter, everyone's figuring out how to make more money off of that. So to get your message to the, to the consumer gets that much harder. But you guys have also spent quite a bit of money beefing up the sales team as well. Yes. Yeah, we had to. I mean, we, uh, for years, um, Sam had an old line years ago, and I had a bar owner in Ohio, uh, John Lane, who has Winking Lizard, told me this. So uh, John told me, Sam talked to him years ago, and John's like, Sam, you have to get more people on the street that the business is changing. And Sam's philosophy was he would never have more salespeople than quality people. Uh, that's how, good news is that's how <laughs> important he took quality. A, you guys have a couple uh, hundred quality people? Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've got that. And, uh, but then you are getting your message across out there and the days of the retailer, the days of the distributor just going, gosh, you know what, I'm gonna, I need to think of what brand I wanna put on tap today or what beer I'm gonna put on my shelf. Uh, they aren't doing that. They aren't searching for brands anymore. They expect everyone to come to them. And we had to at Dogfish, really, we had a great brand, we had a great story, we had a great profitability message, but if we didn't have people on the street, people working directly with our wholesalers, working account to account, that message was just gonna get lost in the, in the maze of all the noise out there. Yeah. Bob, you're on the, the real small end of the spectrum with Uncle Billy's, um, so obviously the uh, amount of investment dollars available to you to, to spend against supporting your brands in the marketplace is uh, completely different than, than a dogfish head. How do you guys uh, think about it as a small brewer and um, you know, knowing that things are, are pretty tight um, and, and you, know, you want to remain profitable. What's the best way to, to spend money as a small brewer to, to support the brand in the marketplace? I would say with extreme caution. <laughs> um, new packages, we have to be you know, convinced that we can sell them. I think the wholesalers have to be convinced. Uh, we have to present those ahead of time. Um, as, as maybe Todd said, there's, there's a thousand events you can do out there. There's a thousand uh, charities that you can support. There's all kinds of things. You have to decide, I think, where your market is, whether these events are going to hit the, the kind of market you want to hit, the target audience you want to hit, whether they're really going to promote your beer. Um, we'd much rather spend beer than money so you know if we can get our product out in front of people instead of buying something that's certainly going to be the preference um i think people uh, as as todd was just talking about people on the street are critical um unfortunately we can't afford as many people as i'd like to have on the street but it's still a relationship business. You have to create that relationship with the distributor first and then the retailers and, and the consuming public to the extent that you can. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about, uh, switching gears slightly and, and kind of going back to some of the package stuff, one of the things that we talked about last week was um, new occasions for uh, drinking craft beer. And we talked a little bit about sort of the third spaces and the packages that that fit in, um, you know, sporting venues or uh, I think amusement parks, things like that. I think is is one of the ones that you brought up, Amy. Um, and we we did spend some time talking about the 19.2 ounce package. Um, and there are some unique package types out there now, be it the 15 pack or the the four pack 16 or the 19.2. I mean, it's not just a six pack of bottles anymore or 12 pack of bottles. It's it's uh, it's gotten pretty complex. So, um, 
when you guys are looking for new opportunities, how much uh, do you guys consider the package types? Uh, how much do you let the package types drive your decision making? And uh, you know, what do you see as sort of the potential future for some of these packs, like the 15 pack and the 19.2? And, and I'll start with Amy. Well, um, we had uh, talked about doing 16 ounce cans for a very long time. Uh, and we, when we bought our new canning line, we made sure they could do them. Um, but it was all about what beer to, to start with. Um, we just wanted to make sure that the window was open, that if we wanted to do one, we could. And so uh, when we um, kind of assessing kind of the, line, the landscape as we see it, uh, you know, we kind of saw it as that as growlers and crowlers, especially here in Austin, had taken on more popularity that the, the, the uh, um, you know, people were more receptive to a larger format can just through the nature of a crowler. Right. Um, and that had shifted people's thinking a little bit. And um, so as we started working uh, on our uh, new double IPA, uh, we called it the high boy. And we just had to do it in a tall boy can because it was called the high boy. So it might have not been the best, uh, you know, analytical decision based um, thing that we did, but it fit the brand. And uh, we'd been wanting to test out a 16 ounce can. And our thinking behind it was that in a double IPA, people might be more willing to share that kind of beer as opposed to shotgun it themselves. So, um, you know, we, we made a go of it and tested it out. And, um, some of the things, I mean, that was a beer that we pre-sold in um, to some grocery store chains, and so we had some confidence in its ability to sell. Um, but the kind of pleasant opportunity or surprise that we had was um, some some places we hadn't expected that were selling a large format can. So um, one of them being uh, Six Flags actually picked up um, 16 ounce can double IPA of High Boy, and I. It's like, lo and behold, that's uh, double IPAs and roller coasters. I wouldn't have guessed that. But uh, <laughs> so that was pretty awesome. Um, but I think that uh, in spaces like ballparks, there's in, in, in other venues like this, um, what they know is that people are not wanting to wait in line. And so certain formats may play well, better in that environment uh, because you've got to catch them, you know, while, while they're there. Um, you know, uh, legally, if somebody can only sell so many cans or, or, or vessels at one time. So, you know, that's that's kind of what we've seen so far in that. Um, I think that the format uh, definitely should fit the brand and the type of beer that you're selling. Um, at least I think that makes sense. Um, you know, here in Austin, no one will beat the 99 pack that Austin Beer Works ever put out. So uh, <laughs> I don't know that anybody's going <laughs> to solve that one again. But, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the multi-packs or the 12 packs, 15 packs, 20, you know, all those, you know, who knows? I mean, I think that to me, like a 12 pack is pretty, pretty spot on. Like if you throw in an extra can, I guess if you can afford to or price it right, it can be appealing. But... Um, you know. <laughs> yeah, Todd, Todd, are you giving away three free beers when you uh, package in a 15 pack? Oh, I was going to start on a positive note first and talk about 19 <laughs> twos, but if you're going to drag me into this, um, I personally do not believe in that model. Uh, I've seen through years there were breweries in Texas, or when I was in a wholesaler in New Mexico, run a Miller wholesaler in Albuquerque, we had people come to us saying, you should be selling the Miller Genuine Draft 15 pack that they're doing in Texas. It's really flying. And also we had Strawberry telling us to sell the 15 pack that Stro Strawberry was really flying with. Stro doesn't exist anymore and MGD's down to a six pack long neck on the shelf. Yeah. And you can get volume. You can get volume on a 15 pack, buy 12, get three free. You don't build a brand. And that's my personal philosophy on that. So hopefully I didn't offend anyone again and never be welcome back. But uh, I'll you, talk about You can never step foot in the great state of Michigan ever again. No, I'm not. A, <laughs> Mike yeah. Stevens will never have you at Founders yeah, Brewery. Not, I, just, <laughs> I, I think it's your value proposition eventually wears thin and it comes back into, you know, what is the brand? What is the experience that everyone's getting from it? And... You can get short-term volume on it, but it's hard long-term to build yeah. like that because there's always big breweries that can come down and match your price. And we as craft brewers cannot 
we can't compete and win in that war. Yeah. Uh, where we can compete and win in that war are things like 192s. Uh, I'll use an example. We were talking about, we realized our can line had the ability to do a 192. It's more talking, having a beer at night, and our packaging guys goes, yeah, we can do 12s and 16s plus 192s. I'm going, what the hell's a 192? <laughs> and we started looking at it, going, start talking about it, and going, wait, what if we could price that so we match what import 24-ounce cans are at? And so, you know, our, our per liquid cost is a little bit higher. Maybe we're throwing a little bit more quality ingredients in our beer. Can we be priced the same and test it? We start testing it, it start doing well. We start getting into venues. We were doing it in liquor stores, C store chains. I was in Pittsburgh and I pull up, we pull up to a, a beer store up in Pittsburgh and we're in a neighborhood right by where all Google's going in up there. And I pull out and there's a recycle bin, a little recycle bin right outside my door. So I start rummaging through it. That's where, that's where you do the real trend spotting yes. is in the recycling and bin, this, yeah. This, <laughs> I could tell this, this person here was probably about 27 years old, living on 192s and quick food coming home at night. And it was loaded with 19 two ounce cans. And you start, and I was talking to the, the guy who owns the store and he goes, yeah, all these kids here, they, and he calls them kids, they're tw late 20s. He goes, they're living small. Hmm. They want to be able to come home for what they need that day throw it away, recycle it, throw it in the recycle bin, and it's gone. So they're buying for that day. The days of, I think we've got to watch moving forward, are people still going to buy 30 packs, or are they going to move more for buying for the moment, buying for the occasion, instead of buying the beer they may need for that week, that month? So I think 19 twos are a very viable option. I'm, I might argue that these people just don't know how to plan effectively. <laughs> <laughs> for their week. But. I may be one of those people. Uh, okay. Sorry, Todd. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I, I know we've, uh, we, we might be uh, running a little bit over time here on, on this panel, and some folks probably want to grab another beer. A um, couple final questions just to wrap up. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about a lot of different uh, issues, you know, package types and trend spotting and, um, you know, different account types and, and finding ways to reach consumers uh, in, in, different, um, in different classes of trade with different styles of beer, with different packages. Um, but one thing we haven't talked about is a market like Texas that does still under-index in terms of uh, local craft share. Um, and this is something that we'll get into a lot more in the next panel, but um, I think 20-something million barrels produced in state, um, and I think of that, you know, BA-defined craft would be somewhere around five or 600,000 barrels. Um, so it's a, it, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of runway for local craft brands. Um, but how do you start to develop or craft a marketplace strategy in uh, an environment like Texas where, you know, local is, is still emerging and y you start to think about other markets around the country that are far more sophisticated or far more developed in terms of craft, how do you guys start to approach uh, your strategies for building a brand in a place where it, there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to be done? Um, and I'll start with Bob. I think um, the statistics are are true, you know, I mean, you can't deny that, which would indicate that there's a lot of opportunity uh, in Texas based on the rest of the country. The problem is, um, and I believe that it's moving in the right direction, the problem is that there's also a lot of resistance, and, and I think that's the other side of that statistic. Uh, most people are still drinking, uh, you know, mass market beers, and so it's not as easy as it would seem to be that, oh, you know, the national trend is 10% and we're at 2%. Um, we have, I think we've, as every market in the country really, honestly, I think every market is overdeveloped for craft beer uh, or craft breweries. And we're just gonna have to work through that. Um, I don't think Texas is any different even though, um, uh, the numbers are smaller for Texas as a percentage of craft beer. Uh, we've got, um, we have a lot of breweries for, for that small percentage, and, uh, and Austin is, is probably uh, even more so than the rest of the state. So I think everything we've said is still valid. 
here in Texas it's just at a little different rate. Uh, you have to be cautious about what you do. You have to be convinced about what you're doing. And I think the market will follow. I'm, I have 100 percent confidence that Texas is moving in the right direction and will continue to move in the right direction. But um, I don't think the statistics of 2.5 percent craft in Texas is necessarily an advantage at this point in time. Todd? Well, from an outsider uh, who's spent a lot of time on and off here through the years, I mean, it's this is a, a country. It's it's Texas could secede from us, as Lester pointed out earlier, and <laughs> operate on its own. So you've got to treat it in that way. Uh, the con the consumer here, from if you go from El Paso all the way to Longview. It's different in every single market. So Austin, I think if you look at Austin, craft is getting very well developed. Uh, it was just up in Dallas in about April, and there's a lot of things happening in Dallas. I think you're going to see a lot of movement in Dallas. Uh, I think you have to look at each of those pockets, and if you put those cities into another state, you go, okay, craft's very developed here. So to look at the whole state as a whole, uh, that's probably harder to do because it is so diverse. Uh, I think it still comes down to a lot of education. And that's why I'm very adamant we cannot cheapen the category. If we begin to cheap cheapen the category, we aren't going to educate consumers why craft beer is be a better option for them, why it's good for why they'll enjoy the experience. Uh, you continue to have to have that access to market. Um, but I'm also someone who's very a proponent of the three-tier system. I grew up in it. That's how dogfish, we, we succeeded. So it's got to work together, but everyone's got to understand. Here's how you educate the retailer, everyone, that this is a good opportunity for them. And so instead of fighting against it, how do, how do you take this opportunity? Because the beer business is flat. The only thing that's really going to continue to add more dollars in the beer business is trading up the consumer. And that's probably where Texas has had missed it a little bit. Not missed, but there's been so much growth here, so it doesn't make it feel like the market's flat. At some point, the growth will slow down, and then you're in the battle of, okay, how do we, how do we grow our business? And if you're a distributor, you're going, I'm in a flat market. How do I grow my business? I've got to trade, up, trade consumers up. Yeah. That's why craft is so important, because if you put that ceiling on it, it's not going to be there. But uh, is, isn't the opposite true as well, that we've seen a shift away from beer because it has gotten so expensive? I mean, beer prices have increased steadily over you know the last 10 or 15 years, and wine and spirits prices, um, in some cases, have, have gotten cheaper. Um, and you know they've been able to capture a lot more market share of, of total alcohol beverage. So I understand the arguments about trading up within beer, but at the same time, that's not you know, the only sort of quote unquote enemy that you're fighting, right? Um, you're still fighting against two other product categories. Yeah, I thought these were going to be nice questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you are. I think uh, someone brought it up the other day, and we were meeting with a distributor of ours who's also a wine and spirits wholesaler. So they also get to talk to the wine and spirits category, and they're always pointing out, but look at all the effort you're putting behind beer. And they did point out 20 years ago, the average ABV on beer was probably about 4.2. Four That's changed like over time. Yeah. yeah. That's changed over time, which has also helped with the pricing component of it. So I think we have to be aware of that. We also have to be aware of there's an aging consumer in the U.S. that that's naturally going to occur. Uh, I was talking to some people from a brewery in China, and they were all of a sudden talking about they need a premium I can't say the word, premiumization, the category. <laughs> and they go, why? Well, our people are getting older. So they aren't drinking the same amount of beer they used to. So that, that's a natural evolution that's occurring. Um, I'm fighting it. As I get older, I keep drinking more beer, but I wish there were more people like me out there. Mm -hmm. So... Well, you just blame millennials if all else fails. That's what I've yeah. learned from uh, blame reading, reading millennials. The news, yeah. Blame your distributor. Blame yeah. your legislature. We're not getting married, you know, but we are having more bachelor parties than ever. So I don't know what's happening there. 
Um, <laughs> I keep running into you and your friends out there at bachelor parties or bachelorette <laughs> parties in weird cities. Oh, it's the, it's the, I think it's the greatest racket on earth, maybe, you know? We just say we're going on a bachelor party and yeah, we have a nice excuse to go to Austin, Texas. Um, or, you know, you throw an event like this. Um, final question, I guess, for you guys. Uh, just, you know, how do you see the rest of the year shaken out for, for craft and for beer in general? Um, BA just reported 5% growth midway through the year. Uh, total beer is, you, you said flat, Todd. I mean, domestic shipments are down close to 4%. Um, so, so beer, I think yeah. Lester told me the other day, uh, and he can confirm when he gets up here momentarily, but um, the worst six months that we've had in, in beer um, in terms of sales uh, overall. So you know, how do you see things shaking out just for the rest of the year? And I'll start with Amy. I will say that 2017 wasn't a great year for us uh, in some regards, but we went through some growing pains, and I think that each brewery and breweries in situations like ourselves will dig deep, find out, reassess what works for you, uh, what doesn't. You know, you got to get focused and uh, see what's see what's working for you, and and really invest in that. I mean, it's it is tempting to be try and be a part of everything, and it, that's not going to work. Um, so I think just being in tune with uh, the places that you're selling, uh, what's working for you, what do you, what do you want to continue doing, and just really trying to thrive in that environment is the only really thing you can do. I mean, you got to try to continue to innovate, make things that are exciting to you, engage the public, get people excited about what you're doing. I mean, I would agree with uh, you know Todd that we've got to continue to educate people and express why quality is better than quantity. And that, uh, you know, I, <laughs> on the storefront battle, I could sit there and do an in-store sampling and see somebody drop $200 on wine and wanna buy the cheapest beer <laughs> on the shelf. And that ain't right, you know? It's like, there's a little bit of a spread around. So um, I think we will have to find ways to both work with spirits and also try to beat them. You know, they've invested a lot in earning that. It didn't just happen overnight. Yeah. And so we have to do better in terms of winning that uh, share back. Todd, rest of the year? Uh, rest of the year, BA is saying craft will be, is up 5% at this point. Total beer is going to be down. Lesser will come up with a number. I'll say he'll guess 2.7. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, and it's down in, the, in a lot of the lower price categories. Uh, craft, the struggle is going to be if craft is up 5%, but there's 20% more breweries than there were a year ago, that math does not add up. And how does craft continue to work among itself without imploding and, and just everyone fighting for dollars and driving pricing down because there's a lot of capacity out there? Yeah. That's the wild card in this, and I don't think anyone knows that answer. So. Uh, and you have domestic brewers who are just, they're going to get, they could get really aggressive out there. And uh, is that good for the industry when you just have a, a demographic that's changing? And we've got to figure out ways as an industry, instead of getting aggressive against each other, how do we bring a younger consumer that's turning 21 back into the beer business? And how do we work the bars and the on-premise or the occasions they're at? This isn't a six-month game for the rest of the year. This is three to five years of work. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you've spent over 40 years in the beer business. You've probably seen a lot of ups and downs over the years, and a lot of people getting worried about, you know, a shakeout or, uh, you know, what's going to happen this year. And, um, you know, you're, you're still kicking. You're still, uh, <laughs> you're still fighting out there with a, with a small brand. Um, how do you see the rest of the year shaking out? And... Uh, is everybody kind of maybe overreacting a little bit here and it'll all be okay? Uh, I don't think they're overreacting. I think it's going to get tougher, not easier. I think Todd's graph of 5% growth and 20% growth in breweries is exactly right. You know, I've, I've been looking at that for the last three years, and I think the, the two curves have, or the two, the two graphs have crossed probably a year or more ago at least. Um, I think there's going to be some consolidation. There's going to be tough times for some breweries. Um, I think the category is strong. The category is going to grow and 
and it, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a competitive, difficult marketplace. I think the I think the the best thing is to focus on quality, as Todd says. I think that's critical because that's what sets our products apart from the mainstream. Uh, I don't think uh, price is necessarily uh, going to do us any favors. Uh, I think if the consumer is going to continue to buy craft and, and specialty beers, that they're going to buy them because they appreciate what they are. They appreciate the quality, the flavor, the the presentation, the image, uh, the way craft and specialty beers makes them feel to drink the the product, the the the, the good feelings they have in drinking something that has quality behind it. Um, I don't think it's, like I said, I don't think it's going to get any easier. I think it's going to get tougher, but I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's just, it's going to take a few years, I think. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Uh, there will be some winners and losers. Everybody needs to pick their strategy and stick to it, trust their gut, and um, move forward and, and hope for the best, I guess. Uh, we're going to take a short break, grab a beer. Um, if we can get everyone to promise that they'll be back in this room in the next 20 or so minutes uh, <laughs> after getting a beer. Uh, we'll kick off our final panel of the evening, uh, which will look at some national trends as well as uh, some stuff going on here in Texas, uh, some of the legislative issues happening. Um, so I think it'll be a great conversation. So come on back, grab a beer, come on back in about 20 or so minutes. Thanks, guys. Big round of applause for these folks.